Good morning, Your Honor. Hartley Bright, B-R-E-I-T-E, on behalf of Gregory Oliver, who's to my right. Good morning, Mr. Morales, Mr. Bright. Mr. Oliver has been bidded. He's standing to the right of counsel. Counsel, this matter is set for sentencing. With regard to the pre-sentence report, both counsels, you have received the pre-sentence report, which is dated April 19, 2017. Any changes, modifications, except for the following. Mr. Oliver's date of, uh, day, uh, age is 22 years now, uh, and his jail time credits will be 771 days. That will be from April 28, 2015 to June 6, 2017. Correct. That is correct, Your Honor, in order than sentencing, sentencing date. date. Yep, sentencing date will be 6 7 2017. Mr. Bright, I will hear you ask the sentencing. Thank you. And before you do that, Mr. Bright, let me just uh, address uh, folks who are in the courtroom. I know you are here, you were previously in my courtroom, and I have reminded you there shall be no disturbance, no emotions. If there is any outburst, any emotion that is expressed that would disrupt this proceeding, you will not be in my courtroom. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Judge, this was, this was quite a lengthy trial. This was a murder trial which involved three defendants, essentially in, involved two victims, one of whom passed away one of whom is, is damaged, I would call severely, for the rest of her life. This was a most serious case. And before I get into the things that I want to say, I would like the record to reflect that nothing I say on behalf of my client is meant to diminish the serious nature and consequences of what happened that day. So I wanted that to be clear. But first, before I discuss what happened, on behalf of my client and especially myself, I would like to thank Your Honor and the court staff. This was a long trial. There were three defense attorneys. All three of us had very different personalities. There was a prosecutor who's, who saw this case differently than the three defendants did. <clears throat> and Your Honor had to manage and balance the personalities and pressures of really four attorneys. And the patience of your honor and the court staff is greatly appreciated. The sheriff's officers who sat with the defendants and myself and were here the entire time of the trial, they were most respectful, most gracious, and most understanding. I will say this, all of them treated my client like a human being. And while you might say, well, that's their job, we're supposed to, I think it ought to reflect in the record that when somebody does something exceptional, it should be noted. This is a society where it's too quick to criticize, and the criticism makes the papers before the, the letters of recommendation ever find their way. So I want to thank the sheriff's officers on behalf of my client and myself for treating my client like a human being. I'd like to thank the prosecutor, Mr. Morales, who's here today, of course. Uh, while he and I saw this case in diametrically opposed positions, I had never tried a case with him. And I say with him because too often in this system, we say try a case against each other. I did not try this case against Mr. Morales. That is a fiction. I tried this case against the smartest juror in the box. Mr. Morales comported himself with the utmost professionalism, and he did nothing but elevate the status of his office. I thank him for his patience with me. I know that sometimes I'm not the easiest person with whom to work, but I thank his patience, his respect, his understanding, and his professionalism. I also wish to thank the two defense attorneys Mr. Paul Charamante and Gregory April, because they assisted me throughout this defense, not only with their prodigious amount of legal acumen and experience, but with their good nature and their charm. So now I proceed. 
with as much respect as I have for Mr. Morales, which is a huge amount, I philosophically disagree with most of what's written in his sentencing memorandum. Mr. Morales certainly knows the law much better than do I. And he cited numerous cases, and I, I think Your Honor even agreed with them, that it is proper at a sentencing to talk about facts or circumstances that were not presented to the jury. I, I must say, as, as an advocate for my client, I find that completely counterintuitive. Mr. Morales cites on page two of his sentencing memorandum, he talks about Ms. McCrae, who may or may not have been the girlfriend of my client on the night of this incident. And it says Gregory Oliver had struck her about the face with a large handgun. Well, that, that never came into the trial. It wasn't part of the evidence. Now, I just say this because as an officer of the court, as someone who lives in this country, I, I find it I find it difficult to accept that Your Honor will consider things like that, which the jury was precluded from considering. The law is the law. I can't change the law right now. Maybe one day the law will make some common sense out of all this. This is a place where common sense is entitled to roam, and it often does. But sometimes I think that these laws make no sense, and it creates a harm to my client. Because now Your Honor can use something against him, which the jury didn't use against him. And whether that's true or not, we don't even know, because there was never a fact-finding process. So it saddens me that things now come into a sentencing that, one, we can't prove or disprove, and two, the jury had no introduction to. Having said that, I respectfully disagree with most of what is in the sentencing memorandum, and I don't think that my client should be given maximum sentences, consecutive sentences, and so forth. So let me reflect upon this trial and what I think should happen to my client. It might come as a surprise for Your Honor to hear that I respectfully say that sometimes my job as a defense attorney frankly stinks. There is often a miscast impression about defense attorneys or some defense attorneys that it's all about making a ton of money, driving fancy cars, having pretty women, all of those things. But the substance of what I do is often very different than the appearance that comes out. It is an absolute privilege to try any case in front of a jury. Proportionally, most lawyers who have a law, most men and women who have a law license have never tried a case in front of a jury. I would say most criminal defense attorneys have never tried a murder trial. I've probably handled 75 homicide cases, somewhere around there. I always say before we start the trial, I say to the prosecutor and defense attorneys, and even to Your Honor, I know I voice this, it's a privilege to try a case of that magnitude. It's the pinnacle, really now, without the death penalty in New Jersey, it's the pinnacle of what we do. So it's an absolute privilege to appear before a court and try a case. I would be lying if I said it was not a thrill. But there are moments that come and strike down all of the thrill and counterbalance the privilege. And that moment came when the victim's family spoke so eloquently last week about their loss. If I have not heard 500 people speak on behalf of victims, loved ones, whom they lost or were injured at the hands of my clients, current and previous, I haven't heard one. But I was honestly very moved by what was said the other day. I was also moved because not only was it passionate and much of it correct, but it was eloquently done. And it was done in a way with complete respect. And it reminded me, again, and sometimes defense attorneys need to be reminded because they advocate for their client in such a sometimes myopic manner that they lose sight of the breadth of what's happened. 
And again, I'm advocating for my client. However, the moment came when the death of a young man and the horrible injuries to a young woman really hit me personally. And that is something that can't be taken back. It's not enjoyable to listen to that. Maybe the victim's family think the lawyers tune out, they don't listen, they don't care, they're texting, whatever. That wasn't the case with any of the defense attorneys at this council table, I can tell you. And I can tell you this, I don't mean it to embarrass them, but I saw tears in Gregory April's eyes. I saw actual tears in a man who's been practicing almost as long as I've been alive. He's tried at least five times as many cases as, as I have in my career. He was sitting at council table with tears in his eyes, listening to the loss of the victim's family. That's real stuff. That's not movies. And it affected me too, because I was upset. And then I saw another attorney older than myself, more experienced than myself, and it touched him. And that's a reminder that even defense attorneys with sometimes their bad reputation, some of it justified, but not always, we're not impervious to what's happened before we got the case. The case is the case. Like I told my client when I first got the case, I don't know what's going to happen to you, but I know one thing, at the end of the day, I'm going home. I'm going to have dinner with my mother when this case is over. I'm going home. The victim's family's going home, but not to the same home that they had the day before this incident occurred. My client's not going home either. There's damage. This is a completely damaged environment. And when I say damage, I don't mean that the court did anything to damage it. I mean that there are real consequences. And I think that sometimes the record will never reflect that there are defense attorneys who are were touched by this. I don't understand why people grab guns and kill each other. I, it was voiced by the victim's family, and I'm saying that to, I don't get it. When I'm angry with someone, I meet him on a mat or a cage, and we have a fight, and it's fine. We agree to it. I don't know why people fight with guns. I, don't, I have 31 guns. I never thought to kill somebody. I don't know when the senseless killing stops. I don't have an answer for the victim's family. I don't like it. Yeah, I profit off it. They can say, well, you profit off it. You make money. <laughs> they knew how much I was paid for this case. I don't think it paid for them. Actually, it didn't even pay for my parking today in the garage, quite honest. I didn't, I didn't take this case for any money. But yes, I do profit off the demise of other people, the senseless demise of other people. But I wasn't there. I don't know what happened that night. The victim's family wasn't there that night either. They don't know. Your Honor doesn't know. My client's family doesn't know what happened that night. The prosecutor doesn't know what happened that night. But we are left with the verdict of that jury. I tell you this, I respectfully disagree with that verdict. I don't understand how a jury could come back that quickly against three defendants with all those serious charges. I was mystified at that. Having said that, while I accept the jury's verdict and respect it, I disagree with it. My client disagrees with it. And while we are saddened, genuinely saddened by what happened, we can say honestly our opinion even if it differs with others here in the courtroom we don't agree with that verdict and so the, this case in a sense doesn't end here today it continues on an appeal which is my client's right and the right of everybody in this country i don't even think the victim's family would deny my client's right they, they appear most understanding and respectful so i feel badly for them because there's not complete closure today there should be in a sense, but there isn't. I cannot stand here and say that your honor should give my client 20 years for what happened. The jury spoke, but however, when you look at the facts that were introduced, there was no indication that my client, who was shot at earlier that night, which is something that's forgotten in all of this, and perhaps he was being shot at at the moment this incident took place, I don't know, I wasn't there. But my client didn't go and intend to 
to hurt anybody that night at that moment. The actions that the jury held him accountable for say something else. But I can tell you that whatever happened that night, I wasn't there. So the case continues. I think there are enough questions in this case, which Your Honor saw, that warrant a departure from even a 20-year sentence. My client has no indictable convictions. My client today is 22 years old. My client's upbringing, which I am not using as an excuse in any way, shape, or form, but it should be noted somewhere in the record that part of the genesis for this senseless killing Part of the reason that this goes on and on in Patterson and Newark, Chicago, and other cities is because there's a lack of structure in a home life. And again, I'm not using this as an excuse, but my client, my client doesn't know who his father is. His father's in jail. He doesn't know who his mother is. She's addicted to crack somewhere. That doesn't excuse what he may or may not have done. But if we want to rectify, if we want to rehabilitate, if we want to stop the senseless killing, then we need to look at not just the victims and their families, but who the alleged perpetrators or the convicted perpetrators are, and maybe start asking why they do this. It's hard, not impossible, but it's certainly difficult to overcome and be a pillar of the community, a home life situation in which there is no mother and father. Every child deserves a mother and a father. We don't always get that in society. That's part of the injustice of the world. There's tons of injustices here happening in, in Patterson, and this is the result of one of them. I think that it warrants attention, if we're going to solve this problem, to look at my client, his background, the background of the other defendants, and what it is that leads them to make such horrible, horrible detrimental decisions. This should never happen again. But yet it's going to happen again, just as sure as I stand here and just as sure as Your Honor sits there. And it makes no sense to me. But what doesn't make sense is giving my client 20 or 30 years for something like this, given all that's in his PSI, given that he has no indictable convictions. I think also running consecutive sentences where there need not be consecutive sentences according to the law would be a piling on of sorts. Yes, I've read Yarborough and all that other stuff and it's great reading case law, but that's case law in a book. This is a human being. And however the victim's family feel about my client, they still appear to have the Christian sense foundation the good sense foundation, the humanity, to realize that my client is still a human being. And we treat human beings differently than we do bugs, ants. We don't squash them when they don't need to be squashed. Hopefully. Your Honor, I'm asking for the minimum sentence to be imposed on the aggravated manslaughter, which is 10 years. That carries with it an 85% parole disqualifier. With regard to the weapons charges, Your Honor will probably be inclined to run a consecutive sentence. I would ask for a five-year consecutive sentence. That also, I believe, carries some sort of parole disqualifier. You guys know the law better than do I, but certainly that type of sentence, given my clients what it was based upon the verdict, his role in all of this would be just and fair. And in the middle of this chaos, in the middle of this debacle of humanity, which by the way was brought on, according to the jury, by my client and two other people. So it's their responsibility. But in the breadth of all of this destruction, there should be a glimmer of reasonableness. And just because the law says you can put them away for 20 or 30, perhaps this particular situation does not warrant that. So respectfully, I'm asking, I'm imploring the court to consider everything in the PSI, all of the facts and evidence that your honor heard during this trial, the fact that there were two other people involved in this, and their, their involvement is, 
is certainly, in our opinion, more reprehensible than my client's, um, given that there's no indication my client uh, injured the young lady in his chambers. Um, with all of that being said, respectfully, we would ask for no more than a total of a 15-year sentence with all of the parole disqualifiers having to be set in place as well.